my, oh, everything, everything gets, goes quiet by itself. This is uh, amazing. Um, so I think we are uh, set to start. Um, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Werner Steger, and I'm a professor of history uh, here at the college, as well as the uh, Greenspan Trust Handel Foundation Endowed Chair uh, in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Um, it's a privilege uh, to welcome all of you to tonight's uh, event. As I mentioned earlier, uh, when I briefly spoke at the uh, dinner across the hall, uh, this is actually the 18th uh, lecture in that uh, series. So we have been doing this for uh, a long time. Uh, the Greenspan Trust and uh, Handel Family Foundation have endowed this chair in 2006 to raise uh, awareness about the genocides of the 20th century and the Holocaust uh, in particular. And uh, for that, they do deserve our gratitude. The Greenspan Trust and the Handel Family Foundation have supported the educational mission of Dutchess, County, uh, of Dutchess Community College over several decades now, and they contributed immeasurably to the cultural and intellectual life in our community. It is their generosity that has made it possible to bring outstanding scholars like Dr. Walter Smith tonight uh, to DCC. Both uh, Shirley and Byrne are in the audience uh, tonight. Please join me in thanking and recognizing them for their generous contributions to enrich educational life at DCC. And they're sitting right in the first, uh, first row. Um, before uh, I introduce tonight's speaker, I would like to extend a special welcome to Dr. Peter Jordan, president of Dutchess Community College, and thank him for his support, his consistent support of events uh, like the one uh, this evening. I don't know where, where Dr. Jordan is. Uh, Ray, uh, oh, where is he? Okay, oh, okay, uh, here. And uh, I also want to uh, extend a warm welcome to uh, uh, Stephen uh, Caswell, a member of the Board of Trustees uh, at Dutchess Community College, and uh, several members of uh, the, uh, the DCC Foundation Board, uh, Kelly Traver, uh, Shirley Roberts Brereton, David Weiss, David Kelly, Adam Potpora, and Richard uh, Raitano. Thank you very much for the work you're doing and for your uh, support. <laughs> Lastly, uh, my appreciation goes to the staff of the DCC Foundation that has organized the logistics of this event, particularly its executive director, uh, Diana Pollard. Uh, I just always, uh, at these events, I put in a quick plug for the DCC Foundation an indispensable part of Dutchess Community College that does not only administer endowments, but provides hundreds of thousands of dollars in scholarships for our students every year. If you appreciate what you see tonight, and you have a checkbook on you, or a Venmo account, or a credit card, I don't know what you pay these days, uh, you know what to do, right? Uh, you can also contribute on their website. Um, and finally, uh, a note regarding the logistics of the event. Dr. M uh, Walter Smith's lecture will be followed by a brief Q&A, uh, as well as a book signing right outside the auditorium. Also at this uh, time, I'd like to ask you um, to silence or turn off your uh, cell phones or other uh, devices you have. So, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, another prolific and extraordinarily productive uh, historian we were able to bring to campus. Dr. Helmut Walser smith is the Martha Rivers Ingram Professor of History at Vanderbilt University and currently a National Endowment for the Humanities Scholar in Residence at the Center for Jewish History in New York. He specializes in the history of modern Germany with particular focus on the history of nation building and nationalism, the history of cartography, religious history, the history of anti-Semitism, and the history of the Holocaust and its memory. He's the author and editor of eight books, including Protestants, Catholics, and Jews in Germany, 1800 to 1914, published in 2001, The Holocaust and Other Genocides, History, Representation, Ethics, uh, published in 2002, and with uh, Werner Bergmann and Christard Hoffmann, uh, Exclusionary Violence, Antisemitic Riots in Modern German History, which was published in 2002. His book, 
The Butcher's Tale, Murder, uh, Murder and Antisemitism in a German Town, uh, published in 2002, received the Frankel, Pri Frankel Prize in Contemporary History and was an LA Times nonfiction book of the year. It, also, it has also been translated into French, Dutch, Polish, and German, where it received an accolade as one of the three most innovative works of history published in 2002. That book, uh, Butcher's Tale, will be uh, for sale outside, uh, and uh, Dr. Smith will be happy to sign it for you. In 2020, he published Germany, a Nation in Its Time, Before, During, and After Nationalism, 1500 to 2000, published oh, said in 2020, uh, which was named by the German pol politics journal Internationale Politik as a book of the year and also has been translated into several languages. That book also will be available outside and uh, Dr. Smith will be happy to uh, sign it. Over the years, his research has been supported by, among others, the Volkswagen Foundation, the Humboldt Foundation, and the Guggenheim, uh, the Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. Tonight's presentation, called Last Gathering in Heigerloch, German Jewish Survivors in Their Hometowns, 1945 to 1949, draws from the research for the book he's currently uh, working on uh, with the working title, Our Towns, Jews, Germans, and the Fight for Local Truth in the Federal Republic, 1945 to 2000. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Walter Smith to DCC. Hello. If you could, <laughs> thank you for that very kind uh, introduction, Werner. If you could give me just a moment to pull up my stuff, I'll be right with you. Um, hello again. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased uh, to be here at uh, Duchess Community College, which I understand you call DCC. Um, uh, I would like to thank especially Dr. Peter Gordon, the president of Duchess Community College. Um, I would like to thank uh, Shirley and Bern Handel, who are here with us uh, for their generosity and for their um, uh, engagement for education and in particular education concerning the Holocaust and genocide. And I would like to thank Werner, of course, uh, and Mike Bowden, uh, a former student of mine uh, who teaches here. I'm very uh, pleased to be here and thank you very much. I'm going to talk to you about a book that I am writing or trying to write. So if you have criticism of this talk, this is a really good time to th hurl them at me um, because it helps me at this point. Um, when you write a book, uh, you know, books, when they're finished, they seem like everything was thought exactly as you see it and read it, but that's actually not the case. Books present all sorts of challenges to authors and one of the great aspects of talking to publics um, is that you get that criticism and that feedback, and it allows you to work through um, the real difficulties of writing books. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this book, and then I'm going to bring you into a chapter. And the book um, is about local memory. And it's about how not just Germans worked on their local memory, how they faced the past, but how both Germans and 
Jews living in the diaspora after the Hitler period worked together, sometimes separately, sometimes together, sometimes across purposes, but nevertheless with two sets of participants in this project. I want to tell you a little bit about how I got to this. I started with the map. I love to make maps. I love, I spend too much money buying them, but I also love to make them. It's cheaper to make them than to buy them. Um, and one of the maps I made was of all the synagogues that were desecrated or destroyed during um, the Nazi period in what used to be called Crystal Night, and now we typically call the November Pogrom of 1938. I mapped all of them out, and I asked myself the question, when did these communities, of which there are more than 1,200, get around to doing something to say 20 years ago or 30 years ago, or 40 years ago or 50 years ago, this unjust event happened. And it happened also in our local town, not just you know, with Hitler, but in our local town. People from our local town contributed to it. When did these towns get around to telling the truth about what happened literally in their backyard? So I began to work on this. And there are a lot of them. And I started to map out the timeline. That's what historians love to do. They love to figure out when something happened. So as I worked this out, I started to realize that 1,200 was a lot of places. And so I started to focus a little bit more closely. I started to look at the Southwest for lots of reasons. But one thing intrigued me in particular. And that is how many small towns started to commemorate this event in a sense of, I mean, what, not, not positively, but negatively in the sense of we have to face our own truth here, um, before 1980. Now, 1980 may seem an arbitrary date to you, but it's actually very much at the beginning of a nationwide explosion of thinking about the past. But what surprised me is how many of these places had done so beforehand. So I began to become more and more interested in the early period. When I became more and more interested in the early period, something else came up into my, my view, which I really hadn't thought of before. And that is that not just Germans were involved in the stories of their hometowns. Also, Jews were involved. Jews from New York, Jews from Australia, Jews from Israel. And I thought, well, I didn't know about this. I've been in the business for 30 years. How come I didn't know about it? And if I don't know about it, maybe other people didn't know about it. And so I started researching this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring you into uh, what is the second chapter of the book. The first three chapters of this book deal with Jews who survived the Holocaust, um, either in the diaspora, either they were refugees and came back. So the first chapter is a lot of US Army soldiers who were Jewish coming back to their hometown and seeing what's going on here. Oftentimes, the Jewish cemetery was a mess. And so they had to figure out how to fix the situation. Um, they wrote reports. In one little town, there, were, there was a newsletter. And so every week, there was a report on what this town is doing. Um, other kinds of places had different sources. The town that I'm going to talk about had a picture. And I'm going to come to this in a moment. But what I want to do now is to immerse yourself in what is my really first attempt to write a chapter. And the chapter is about a place called Heigeloch, and it's in southwest Germany. Heigeloch sits upon interlocking limestone bluffs formed by the winding path of the Ayach River. It is located some 20 miles southwest of the university town of Tübingen, in the northwestern corner of what used to be the lands of the Hohenzollerns, a territory of rolling hills, 
a handful of towns, innumerable villages, a famous if reclusive monastery, and a set of stunning castles perched upon hills or built into cliffs. Like Buchau, subject of chapter one, Heigerloch was a Judendorf, a Jewish town. In the mid-19th century, it's nearly 400 Jews made up a third of its residents, with most Jewish families living by trading cattle. The men took off on Monday, their cows often in tow, and returned on Friday in time for Shabbat. Mostly, oops, mostly the Jews of Hagalach lived in the lower part of town known as the Hag, a, quote, freely chosen ghetto that centered on a synagogue, a marketplace, a group of modest homes, and a Jewish inn called the Rose. On special holidays such as Purim or Hanukkah, the Rose beckoned Jews from the nearby towns of Hechingen and Hob and from the surrounding villages of Beisingen, Dettingen, and Rexingen. It was a flourishing Jewish community, remarked a traveler in the 1920s as he was passing through town, noticing that quote, many Jewish children enliven the streets. Alice Weil, a 10-year-old girl when Hitler came to power in January 1933, was one of them. We had a beautiful time before Hitler, she later remembered. Over the course of three deportations, the Nazis brutally wiped out this flourishing Jewish community. The first deputa uh, deportation began with a list and a letter requiring Jews to report to the local train station in the early morning of November 27, 1941. The directive included precise details about how much luggage they could take with them, how much they had to pay for the ticket, yes, they had to pay, and what they could not take, or what they could and could not take. After sending the Jews of Heigelach off in a train to stuttgart Killesberg, a station in northern Stuttgart, the Nazis forced the Jews to wait for days in a cramped holding pen as transports came in from other Jewish towns and villages in the region. Then, early in the morning of December 1, 1941, the Nazis transported the Jews of Heigelach, their names Levi, Hilb, Weil, and Ullmann in a crowded passenger train destined for the Latvian city of Riga. Of the rural Jewish communities in Württemberg and Hohenzollern, Heigeloch endured the largest number of Jews sent away on this transport. Of all the regions, cities, towns, and villages, only the big city of Stuttgart sent more. Alice, the third of the three Weil sisters and the one who remained with her parents remembered it as the day the Nazis sent away, quote, my family and many more, my mother's brothers, my two dear cousins, all from the same town. Along with over a thousand Jews from Württemberg and Hohenzollern, she was also on this train. The second transport occurred in April 1942 when the, when the Nazis deported 24 Jews from Heigeloch to a temporary holding station in Itzbika, Poland, southeast of Lublin. Those who did not die in Itzbika of hunger, exposure, or illness were sent to the extermination camps of Belzec and Sobibor, where the Nazis and their Ukrainian or Latvian helpers drove them out of the trains, forced them to undress, and rushed them, men first, women second, into the gas chambers. The third transport departed in late August 1942 with 135 Jews packed on board, the largest number of any community in Württemberg or Hohenzollern. In this last transport, whose ultimate destination was Theresienstadt, only 25 actually lived in this town or had lived earlier in this town. This was because between 1939 and 1942, the Nazi government had begun to shunt dispossessed Jews from the big cities of Stuttgart, Heilbronn, Ulm, and other large cities into so-called old age homes, such as existed in the towns of Herlingen and Laupheim, and into a number of Laupheim, Oberdorf, and indeed Heigeloch. 
From the towns and villages of Württemberg and Hohenzollern, not many survived the December 1941 transport to Riga, the first deportation. From Buchau, Lup Laupheim, Hechingen, and Buttenhausen, these are all towns in the region, not one came back. From Rexingen, roughly six miles away from Heigeloch, only two returned. From Heigeloch, however, eight would come back, back alive. This was at least a contrast to the second transport from which no one from Heigeloch returned, and the third from which only one person, Jetta Levy, came back to her hometown. This is just a list, a monument in that town to the survivors. Um, it's actually on the synagogue, uh, which was a movie theater for a while in the post-war era, uh, a grocery store for a while, and it has been reworked now and is now a museum as a synagogue. The who belongs to this on this plaque is somewhat different in my re recounting from their recounting. Um, that's largely due to um, they took on Harry Kahn, uh, who I think should be in Beisingen, but this is all silly stuff. Um, in the late summer of 1945, so we're after the war, Captain Edward Levy of the U.S. Army rolled into Heigeloch in his army jeep. One of six children, Levy had left Heigeloch as a 15-year-old in 1925 in order to help build the family textile business in Denver, Colorado. Over the years, he had nevertheless kept close ties to his hometown and had come back on several occasions, including once just before the November pogrom of 1938, when he attended the bar mitzvah of his younger cousin, Justin Hilb. Now, in 1945, after the war was won, he had hoped to help the survivors by getting them together. He organized food and drink and reserved a room in the so-called little castle in the Hague, just behind the synagogue. He also invited a photographer, Paul Weber, who took the picture uh, that you see here. Save for Captain Levy, a fellow Jewish American soldier named Herbert Schwartz from nearby Rexingen, and one of the women, the Jews sitting at this table were all survivors of the Riga transport that carried nearly 1,000 Jews to their death. 42 came back alive. 11, including seven from Heigeloch and two from Rexingen, are in this photograph. Each had endured more than three years in the frozen camps of Latvia and northern Poland. Starting from the left and counting clockwise, the people pictured at the table with its immaculate white cloth and festive settings are Berta Levy with a glass in hand, her son Egon looking down, and Berta's sister Selma Weil, who seems to stare directly at us, as does Max Ullmann to her right. Then there is the young Alice Weil, who forces a smile for the photographer. Captain Edward Levy, who convened the gathering, and Victor Marx wearing a white shirt and black tie. He is sitting next to Bertha Schwartz of Rexingen, his aunt, and Herbert Schwartz of the US Army, a cousin. To the right of Herbert Schwartz is Sally Lemberger, also of Rexingen. He was deported on his 18th birthday. The next person is Alfred Nördlinger, who lived with his parents in Heigeloch, and who gestures towards us with an energetic toast. The table is rounded off by a person we think is Friedel Bear. We're not sure about her. We know the least. Then a young-looking 22-year-old Manfred Schorsch from Stuttgart and Max Ullmann's younger cousin, Irvin Ullmann. Of the rural Jews of Württemberg and Hohenzollern who survived Riga, more than half are in this photograph. What was felt? said, talked about. Unfortunately, the record is largely silent. Levy himself remembered only that, quote, very little was spoken, but one could see that they had suffered a lot, unquote. Sally Lemberger, one of the survivors from Rexingen, later recalled that Alice Weil wept the whole time. Many years after the photo was taken, Levy reread a letter 
he had sent back home at the time, in which he quoted Alice's lamentations about their cousins at the gathering. Dear Max, such a wonderful fellow, so musical and so young. He played the accordion so well. And Justin, they used to sing together. What a fine boy he was. All dead, killed by the SS. All dead, dead. In 1938, at the time of Just, Justin's bar mitzvah, Captain Levy had tried desperately to get Justin and his brother Max out of the country without success. The father was reluctant to let his sons go. In Riga, the Nazis killed all three of them. The mother survived. Her name was Hannah Hilb, and for reasons we can only guess at, she was not at the gathering. In July 1945, Trude Schloss returned to Heigeloch, the town of her grandmother and her uncles. It is from her hand that we have the only letter from a Jewish survivor of Riga that is actually from this time and about this place. The letter tells us that Alice Violet, quote here, Alice Violet is already at home. Unfortunately, she has no parents anymore. Alice had come back on June 16, 1945, and walked around the town for a few hours before going to see the woman, who was once the maid of the house. But Alice, now 22 years old, was thin and haggard. Her former maid did not even recognize her. When she finally realized it was Alice standing in front of her, the maid was overjoyed. She also took Alice in to the house. Others came and helped. One woman, who had taken objects from the vile household, gave them back. At the time, it was an unusual gesture. Most people did not do this. And it reminds us also that when Jews returned, they often looked for the things stolen or left behind. Alice's search brought her to a barn where she found a pile of prayer books. Going through them, she eventually found two from her mother, whom the Nazis had murdered in Latvia. As historians, we are condemned to confine our imagination in a straitjacket. Unless a photograph captures a, mon a moment or a document details it, we cannot pretend to see Alice's downcast eyes, take in her crestfallen silences, or hear her inconsolable sobbing. But we know that in Germany, as well as in other parts of Europe, survivors returning to their hometowns often search desperately for something, anything, a pillow, a doll, a candlestick, that reminded them of a life they had once lived. We also know that as they rifled through what were now often other people's closets and other people's chests, they often came up empty, and the new owner's dubious pretensions of ignorance often darkened that emptiness. Having discovered her mother's prayer books, Alice did not come up empty. As she leafed through them, she could decipher her mother's scribbles recording seasons, anniversaries, and religious holidays family time, and Jewish community time. For Alice, this kind of time would never return, at least not here. Meanwhile, the rhythms of rural life continued in southwest Germany. Heigeloch went about its business, and time did not heal. In Stuttgart, the rigor survivors in the Degeloch DP camp had heard that a Jewish girl was in town. One of them, Victor Marx, also a survivor of Riga, had access to a car, and they drove to Heigeloch. You cannot stay here. You have to come to Stuttgart, they said. You cannot be alone. There was a second American soldier at the Heigeloch gathering. This was Herbert Schwartz of nearby Rexingen. Born in 1922, Schwartz had emigrated with his mother, father, and younger brother in 1938, 
and returned to his home village as soon as the end in hostilities allowed. Nestled on the side of a hill behind the town of Hob on the Neckar, that's a river, um, Rexingen was in some ways like other Jewish villages in southwest Germany. Relations between Christians and Jews were generally amicable. Both parties participated in local life, with Jews and Christians serving in the volunteer fire department, the town council, and any number of charitable organizations. Like other such villages, Rexingen boasted a modest but handsome synagogue, with women sitting upstairs, men downstairs, and most of the Jews strictly observant. But here the similarities ended. Unlike many other Jewish villages, Rexingen struggled much less with intermarriage and outmigration. That is to say, the Jewish community in Rexingen struggled much less with intermarriage and outmigration, so that when the Nazis seized power in 1933, Rexingen's Jewish community still made up a quarter of its roughly 1,000 inhabitants. Rexingen was also no bastion of Nazism. Only 16% of the voters of this village ever voted for the brown shirts. But perhaps the most important peculiarity involved the decision of the Jewish community's younger members to emigrate to Mandate Palestine en bloc. Shortly before the November pogrom of 1938, a third of the Jews of this village left Germany and founded a community called Shavetzion, Return to Zion, not far from the Mediterranean coast in what is now northern Israel. Over time, what started as 15 houses, as many barns, a grain silo, and a water well would become a beacon for the Jews of Württemberg. Schwartz returned to Rexingen in the summer of 1945 and found only two survivors, 22-year-old Sally Lemberger and 42-year-old Bertha Schwartz. A third, Hedwig Schwartz, badly injured in Theresienstadt but survived, was at the Catholic Maria Hospital in Stuttgart. Before making it home, Lemberger and Schwartz barely lived through the last harrowing months of their nearly four-year-long ordeal. In this time, these last months, Sally Lemberger's life hung in a precarious balance. After keeping him for more than three years in Jungfernhof near Riga, the Nazis stripped Lemberger, uh, I'm sorry, shipped Lemberger to a camp near the Latvian town of Ogra, then to Kaiserwald concentration camp close to Riga. Packed like sardines in a boat, he was thereafter sent off to Stutthof near Danzig. Then, as the Russian army bore down on this deadly concentration camp in September 1944, the Nazis moved the inmates again cramming them into cattle cars, open cattle cars, headed to Buchenwald, and from there to Remsdorf and Thuringen. As the American army drew near, the Nazis again forced Sally Lemberger, along with Victor Marx and some 2,000 prisoners, into an open cattle car and directed it through an active war zone down south to, towards Theresienstadt. Constantly under attack, the train took five days, and then stopped about 200 miles short of the concentration camp. It was early April 1945. With the end of the war a few weeks off, the Nazis made the inmates walk the rest of the way, an eight-day death march to typhus-ridden Theresienstadt. From the march, just half of the prisoners survived. To the hungry, worn, and bedraggled survivors of Riga, Kaiserwald, Stutthof, and Buchenwald, Theresienstadt nevertheless appeared, and this is a quote, as if it were heaven, unquote. At least the people there were wearing untorn clothes, Sally Lemberger would say. Then, finally, on May 8th, the Soviet army liberated the camp. Lemberger got out just before the Soviets shuttered the camp, again, because of quarantine and slowly made his way to Stuttgart. He then walked for a day, or hitched a ride, I'm not sure, to his native village of Rexingen. Bertha Schwartz likewise only made it back to her Swabian 
home village after a trying odyssey. In the photograph of the last gathering, she is sitting on the far end of the table on the left. She had lost um, her husband the year before, and she was nearly dead herself when the Russians liberated her in March 1945. Unclear if she had witnessed or endured the widespread rape of Jewish women that often came with Russian liberation. Certain is that Schwartz suffered from the ravages of typhus and had to be hospitalized in a Pomeranian village. After her release from the hospital, her survivor friends brought her to Berlin, where, with her wounds still unhealed, Bertha Schwartz was put into a convalescent home, staying there until July 19, 1945. When Bertha Schwartz finally got back to Rexingen, she knocked on the door at 36 Freudenstetter Straße, that's, that's a street address, a few houses up from the synagogue, but no one answered. Dora Speet, who had bought the home from Bertha's mother in 1938, was in another village helping to bring in the harvest. When Speet heard of the news of Bertha's return, she came back to the village and the two women talked. We do not have a record of what they said to each other. All we know is that during the first few nights, Bertha slept in Speet's or her former house, and thereafter in a separate apartment with multiple rooms within the same house. Bertha kept this separate apartment or rented or lent rooms to others, such as Sally Lemberger, who also sometimes stayed here. Nevertheless, both Bertha Levy and Sally Lemberger spent most of their times with her friends or their friends in Degeloch, that is to say in Stuttgart in the DP camp. Reduced to its basic psychological content, home, what they were trying to come back to. Home, according to the um, Holocaust survivor writer Jean Amory, is in essence security. Yet what Bertha Schwartz and Sally Lemberger and many others had experienced was the precise opposite. Their homes had become unlike home. The German word would be unheimlich. If you walked up Main Street, Jewish families lived in every house, Lemberger said. The location of the village, the slope of the streets, and the visage of the houses were all the same. But the family, the friends, the neighbors, the cousins, they would not return. Gone, Lemberger later exclaimed. I mean, really unbelievable. You are lost. Lemberger said. The philosopher Hannah Arendt once defined loneliness as a, quote, situation in which I, as a person, feel myself deserted by all human companionship, unquote. This goes far to explaining why so few Jews returned to their small community and stayed. In the end, most of the survivors of Heigelach at the Heigeloch, I'm sorry, most of the survivors at the Heigeloch gathering made the DP camp in Degeloch, their dwelling. It's always been remarkable to me that Jews, they come back to these little towns and they end up going back to what is essentially a kind of a camp. Um, it's true in Stuttgart, it's true throughout uh, Bavaria where there are many DP camps as well. Of the 11 survivors of the Riga transport who gather around the table in September, seven of them, including all the men still alive, lived here in Degeloch, as did a number of other survivors who had boxed their way home from various camps in the east. The Degeloch DP camp was one of the nicer looking DP camps, I can tell you that. Um, it consisted of a large brick building a big, big villa, as Alice Weil recalled, with a few smaller houses around it. Most lived in the large building with multiple floors and rooms of all different kinds. On one floor, five survivors of Riga, all but one of whom had attended Captain Levy's gathering, were housed in two adjacent rooms. 
Bertha Schwartz and Alice Weil of Heigeloch, along with Hannelore Kahn of Stuttgart, resided in one room, while Victor Marx from Tübingen and Sally Lemberg from Rexingen were in the other room. Bertha was Victor's aunt, and Victor would soon be engaged to Hannelore, 20 years his junior, despite Hannelore's friend Liesel's counsel to go find herself a nice, rich husband in America. Irvin Ullmann and his cousin Max were also here, and so was Alfred Nordlinger from Heigeloch and Manfred Schorsch from Stuttgart. Degeloch was a very different place than the one the survivors had left behind. Gone were the brutal capos, the merciless SS, the vicious dogs, the unpredictable violence, and the omnipresent fear of deportation. It, Degeloch, was really beautiful, Alice Weil recalled. Sexual desire reawakened. People sang and played and made love. And there was food. Each dish tasted like the best one I'd ever eaten, a resident remembered. For breakfast, they received white breads with a lot of butter and jelly. One could also have seconds, and people ate with real knives and forks. We had all this silverware, a survivor who resided in Degeloch later recalled. Somehow, I had forgotten all about it, how to eat with the silverware. With food in their stomachs and their conditions improving, the survivors quickly turned their attention to replacing the shabby, ill-fitting clothes on their backs. In, the early December, in early December 1945, the newly constituted Jewish religious community of Stuttgart sent around a survey asking what survivors need, needed. It was getting cold, and virtually no one had any warm jackets or gloves or mittens. Many needed sweaters. Many needed shoes. And almost everyone asked for underpants, undershirts, stockings, and handkerchiefs. In the main, the clothes came from the refugee organizations in the United States that had mobilized in order to help Jews in the DP camps. Survivors also asked for bed sheets, cooking pots, and utensils. Victor Marx wanted to know if he could get a radio. Manfred Schorsch and Sally Lemberger asked for a suit. And Alice Weil, because hers were torn, requested slippers. As the material conditions of life began to get better, relief at survival gave way to apprehension about the fate of loved ones. Anxious and desperate, survivors filled out forms, made requests to tracing services, and implored people for news about parents, siblings, and cousins, even, quote, if they had little hope of finding anyone alive. When Alice Weil told a Jewish GI that she had two sisters in Chicago, the GI told her to write something down quickly, and he would expedite the letter to the United States. Alice wrote some version of, I'm alive, and within two weeks, her sisters wrote back, overjoyed. Not everyone had such an easy time finding kin. Hanalora Khan wrote her fingers sore, trying to find relatives and get them to help. One topic that cannot get its due in this chapter is the emotional problems that one might expect of a traumatized population, and which historians have been reluctant to address for the immediate post-war era. Of the five male survivors at the table, at least four consulted psychiatric medics in Stuttgart, complaining of sleeplessness, nightmares, depression, and inability to focus, breaking out in sweat, and impotence. These problems did not surface because of some self-imposed silence. Throughout occupied Germany, DP centers were hothouses of survivors telling their stories. And Stuttgart was no exception. An Orthodox rabbi from the US Army named Herbert Eskin had set up a Jewish community center in western Stuttgart, some two kilometers from Degeloch, from the steep DP camp. It was a blessing to them, he said many years later. Quote, we used to stay up till 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. They would tell me droves of them, each one telling some of their experiences. And then after they'd get through talking to me, they'd say, you, haven't, you think you've heard a lot. You haven't heard nothing yet. Each one telling the tragedy, the suffering. Eskin did not write their stories down at the time. We only know of them through restitution documents, subsequent writings, and interviews. 
memories shaped by and filtered through legal parameters, narrative convention, and the passing of decades. Unfortunately for the Heigeloch survivors, we can only get to these narrative elements through subsequent oral testimony, given 40 to 50 years after the fact. Nevertheless, some narrative elements ring through with jarring clarity and have significant resonances. A number of survivors clearly recalled their arrival in Jungfernhof, an open field with primitive unroofed barracks just outside of Riga. In these accounts, there is little d doubt about the veracity of detail. More interesting is how the detail came to occupy the center of an explanatory strategy. In an interview given in the 1990s, Alice Weil, for example, saw, quote, a mountain of luggage, but no people, and claimed to immediately recognize it as an ominous sight. The interviewer missed the importance of the image in the otherwise serene and unflappable Alice Weil insisted in the interview that they return to it. And we saw, this is Alice, and we saw, like I said, this mountain of luggage and everything. But we saw the names. They came from Berlin. But the people were gone. They were already killed. The interviewer then interjects, but you didn't actually see any. Impatient. The 71-year-old survivor curtly interrupts her and says, we knew right away. The luggage is there. Where are the people? In her retelling of what she saw, Alice Weil left little room for what must have been that initial moment of existential uncertainty. Instead, she interpreted her experiences from an after-the-event standpoint. What she experienced at the moment is subsumed under the question of what it all meant and con condensed it into a poignant image, the mountain of discarded suitcases. A number of survivors testified to hangings, though not with the almost Christian overtones famously given to it in Elie Wiesel's memoir, Night, in which a boy is hung, just as Jesus Christ was crucified between two others, and his body dangles as a voice among the inmates of Auschwitz asks, for God's sake, where is God? And a voice within Wiesel answers, this is where, hanging from this gallows. Instead of imagining an iconic religious scene, Irvin Ullmann of Heigeloch remembered, quote, he had to help build the thing to hang him, unquote. When the interviewer asked him if he also had to pull the noose, Irvin bent down his head in, in assent, adding, quote, not alone. He placed the story in a telling of the two worst things that he had seen, the other one being a transport from Berlin of what he took to be handicapped people arriving in a freight train in Jungfernhof on February 19, 1942. Quote, when we opened those cattle cars, you couldn't see who's alive and who's dead. They just fell out, some still alive, some not. And then the SS, they just went around and shot them, one after the other, maybe about 60 or 80 people, unquote. Ullmann then shifted his narrative voice from a witness of horror back to an unwilling participant in it. We had to, quote, we had to dig a hole not too far away from the railroad station and we just threw them in there, unquote, he said, looking down. Quote, we couldn't carry them, so we pulled them in the snow, unquote. Irvin Ullmann was not the only Heigeloch survivor whom the Nazis forced into helping them do their murderous bidding. In Jungfernhof, Alfred Nordlinger was one of 15 people on so-called train duty. Nördlinger and the other inmates had to, quote, sort out the new arrivals, which meant that, quote, people who could still walk were sent to the ghetto and the other were killed, unquote. In both cases, we hear the anguished memory of survivors 
too frank and honest to cover the wound, but too powerless to mend it. With Alfred Nordlinger, we cannot see his gestures as he explained th this experience to an American psychiatrist in the late 60s. But with Ullmann, we watch it on tape in the USC Shoah archive in Los Angeles. We watch it, we watch it on tape as his eyes cast down and he tilts his head to the floor. We not only hear memory, we also witness it. And we come to realize that the anguished conscience of survivors was not just about them surviving while others did not. It was also about what they were forced to do to survive. Other elements also broke through, the confounding conventionally, uh, also broke through confounding conventionally um, redemptive narratives of everything turns out well in the end. One involves relations between men and women. Unsentimentally, Trude Schloss recounts that there was a case of pregnancy in Jungfernhof, and she does not hint that it was a result of rape. And with a smile that an older man brings when he thinks about a younger love, Irvin Ullmann admits that while at that vast, cold, and deadly SS farm, he actually had a girlfriend. He conceded that it was also sexual, his words, his first time, in fact, and that many years after the war, he occasionally saw his former lover at meetings of the organization of the survivors of the Riga ghetto. The most poignant narrative element in what survivors told us is nevertheless and undoubtedly the loss of loved ones. In a number of testimonies, survivors honed in on the precise context of when they saw their parents last. According to her written account, intended for her son, Hannah Laura Khan, Marx at the time of writing, wrote that she had cried her heart out when her mother was selected to leave the camp in March 1942 and begged the SS to let her go with her mother. But the SS man threatened to kill Hannah Laura instantly if she did not stop weeping. In August 1944, Hannah Laura lost her father, whom she would go to see every evening and whose frost, whose frost bitten toes had been amputated without amnesia, uh, anesthesia, without anesthesia. At Kaiserwald concentration camp, she had talked to him across two rows of fences that separated the men's prison yard from the women's. Then one day, her father was simply gone. The SS had thrown him on a truck, delivering prisoners to a killing site for the sole reason that the truck had extra room in the back. Irvin Ullmann also remembered that the SS threw people into trucks heading to the shooting pits on a whim. And he too recalled precisely when the Nazis murdered his parents. On January 16, 1942, the SS took Ullmann's father to Salapsis camp, where the father likely froze and starved to death. On March 26, the SS told Ullmann's mother she was to be sent to a fish factory, but in fact loaded her and many others on a truck, drove them into the woods, and in Irwin's terse and sad words, had them shot. With great precision, survivors also recalled losing members of their extended family. From the Riga ghetto, Alice Weil recalled walking way out of her way as she liked to do to see her cousin. She was talking about Justin Hilb, whose bar mitzvah, Captain Levy, came all the way from Denver to celebrate. Then one day, he was simply not there. She never saw him again. Why do you decide to tell your story, asked the interviewer. Because I have to tell it for them who cannot talk anymore, Alice replied. Irvin Ullmann, and here's Alice Weil as they give their testimonies. Mourning, speaking for the dead, was a central element of the survivors' experience. But the survivors did more than talk. They also worked for the dead. They put up memorial stones in the despoiled and desecrated Jewish cemetery. And these stones, placed in a religious, not a secular space, were the first post-Holocaust markers of local memory in Germany. Now, 
I'm going to skip a section in which I talk about these acts of putting up these gravestones by the very men and women you were looking at at the table of the last gathering of Heigelach for reasons of time. By late 1947, most of the Jews who sat together at the table in the little castle had already emigrated. Victor, Mark, uh, Victor Marx, his new wife Hannelore, and his aunt, aunt Bertha Schwartz crossed the Atlantic in the Marine Flasher, the first ship to bring DPs to the United States after President Harry S. Truman's executive order requiring immigrant quotas to designate places for DPs. The Marine Flasher departed from Bremerhaven on May 11, 1946, and arrived at Ellis Island, New York, on May 20th, to throngs of family members, friends, well-wishers, and reporters. Having connected with her sisters, Alice Weil was on this ship, too. By the way, this is her wedding picture. She would get married soon thereafter. Max and Irvin Ullmann and Alfred Nordlinger were also on that ship. Soon thereafter, others followed the passage across the ocean. Sally Lemberger with his fiance, Ruth Lang, a survivor of Riga, who was also at Degelo, boarded the second ship, the Marine Persch, excuse me, departing from Bremen in June 1946. Manfred Schorsch also left Via a more, but via a more circuitous route. Suffering from tuberculosis, he managed to get himself to a sanatorium, first in Stuttgart, then in Davos, Switzerland. Thereafter, he spent a short amount of time in Geneva before receiving his papers to leave for the United States in 1948. By the spring of 1949, the time of the very founding of the Federal Republic of Germany with its new constitution, only two survivors of Riga sitting at that table that Captain Levy had convened were still in Germany, the sisters Bertha Levy and Selma Weil in Heigeloch. Bertha Levy had lost her husband and brother in the cold fields of Estonia in February 1944. She also lost her son, Egon, who sat to the right of her at the Heigeloch gathering. In one of the concentration camps, a Nazi bashed Egon's head with the butt of a rifle. He passed away soon after the Heigeloch gathering of September 1945, not having reached his 22nd birthday. Then finally, in October 1949, Bertha Levin Selma Weil also left for the United States. But not before testifying at the trial of the Nazis who had demolished the interior of the Heigeloch synagogue. For the rest of their days, the two sisters, Bertha and Selma, would live in a secluded wood in the northern Catskills Mountains. By 1950, a local history had transpired here that mirrored wider developments in post-war Württemberg and Germany. The Rexingen Jews were gone, save for Hedwig Schwartz, a survivor of the Treisenstadt transport, who never again left that Catholic hospital in Stuttgart until she was buried in Rexingen on November 9th, 1952. Of the seven survivors who had come back to Heigeloch from the killing fields of Riga, not one stayed in this small picturesque town. The half-timbered houses in the so-called voluntary ghetto, tucked into a horseshoe bend in the Ayash River, were bereft and empty of Jewish life again. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. And uh, we're uh, taking some questions. Um, if anybody has any, any questions for the speaker. Hello. Okay. So um, I was just wondering, like, what got you like 
this interested in the topic? Uh, I, um, it, it's a little bit with, thanks for the question. Um, I would answer it from two kind of perspectives. One was that map I, I showed you um, from the beginning, at the beginning with its 1,200 synagogues. And I simply asked a, a, a historian's question of when did they get around to it? And I, and I, I discovered that um, no one knew the answer to this question. And so once you find a question like that and you work to answer it, you, you get drawn in. And what drew me in was especially the early commemorations because I had no understanding of why, for example, there would be such a commemoration in a little village. I thought, this is how stupid I was at the beginning of this. I thought, wow, what a progressive little village. And at first, it didn't even occur to me that it was the Jews who returned who put up these monuments. So, so partly the being drawn in from the question and feeling that I'm seeing something that I had not been taught to see. So that's one answer. But the other has to do with debates about memory politics in Germany, which are, are strange debates for historians because they're often, oftentimes the historians want to be, or imagine themselves, and sometimes they are, participants in these debates. So the very question of simply how it happened, it's such a classic historian's question. You know, the father of modern history, Leopold Ranke, said, you know, just tell it, vis eigentlich gewesen, how it really was. If you can figure that out, we're going somewhere. Uh, he, that wasn't how we talked, but you understand what I'm saying. Um, and he, and just, I think that the world of memory um, doesn't do enough of this, what I sort of like to do, and that's this real close social history work where you're just trying to figure out stuff. So that's what, what drew me in. Two questions, basically. First, <clears throat> is this an example of what happened with most small towns, small communities, within southwest Germany anyway, uh, that most of the survivors, the limited number, came back and then eventually left? And the second part is, um, what has happened since then? Because uh, implied in the announcement of the lecture was uh, what had happened afterwards. These yeah. towns began to recognize uh, not not the Jewish people who returned, yeah. but the townspeople themselves. Uh, I know it's part of the book, but I'd like to know uh, how that evolved. Yeah, no, Thank it's you. a great question, and Thank you. and, and uh, it does involve me unfolding a little bit of the book itself. But the first question about one of the reasons why Heigelach is so important to look at is because it's a little town with a lot of survivors, right? Most survivors end up in the big cities, and that has a somewhat different dynamic, in part because they're much more anonymous here. Everyone knows everyone. You walk around the streets of, if you're a return Jew, you walk around the streets of Heigelo, you know who was a Nazi and who wasn't, you know who helped and who didn't, and so on, so forth. It's not comfortable. That's not the right word, but y you understand what I'm saying. Um, so, Eigelach was interesting because it's like a limit case, right? You say, well, even if you have this many survivors, they all go. Why do they all go? So that's, that's why Eigelach was interesting to me, also because I liked the picture and you know, I thought the challenge of working through the picture was important to me. Um, but there were places where they stayed. So in neighboring Beisingen, there is a cattle trader named Harry Kahn, who I mentioned just briefly, but he actually goes and stays, and he reopens his cattle trading business. He tries to get Sally Lemberger to stay, but Sally Lemberger is saying, no way, not, you couldn't, not for all the cows and, you know, wherever. Um, so, so there's, there's, uh, so there are examples, there are counterexamples, um, but there aren't many. And of the Jews who stay, and this is the next chapter, it's, it's called Two Buses uh, 
from Theresienstadt. So these are buses that pick, the city of Stuttgart sends buses to Theresienstadt to pick up survivors. And it's a little bit of a question who starts this whole business, whether it's that same rabbi, the mayor of Stuttgart, who was also a concentration camp survivor or someone else, doesn't matter. The, so they get these buses and they bring them back to Stuttgart. And I had the, the, the list of all 47 uh, survivors from one of the buses. So that's, historians love that kind of source. So I drill down and say, okay, what happens to these 47 survivors? A whole bunch of them are in mixed marriages, so they, or so-called mixed marriages, so they go to their spouses. Um, and they largely stay because they have somewhere to go. Um, a lot of them, because it's Theresienstadt, which is like the sometimes called the old person's ghetto, a lot of them are in fact older. These people are all young. They're in their 20s. Uh, Bertha Schwartz was older. She was by far the oldest. But most of the rest are in their 20s. They have a lot of, you know, they want to get out. So there's a lot of that. Um, but if you're in your, you know, 60s, 50, late 50s, 60s, and 70s, you don't know any foreign languages, you've only done one trade your whole life, uh, the, the barrier to, to it's harder to just say, I'm going to go start my life in some Spanish-speaking country or some English-speaking country. And so most of them ended up staying, and within typically within four years, they were in old age homes. And then from there, we lose our traces, more or less, of them, except for one or two examples of uh, women. And they're mostly women, also, uh, who lived in, in uh, who wrote memoirs. Um, so that's the so that's kind of the the answer to the to the first question. It, it's a complex, but it's it's an answerable but complex uh, question. So what happens afterwards? That too is different from town to town, but I guess my research is showing that throughout the 50s, it's still largely Jews who come back. The next chapter is about a village called Buttenhausen where someone comes back from that village. He has ties, for reasons I'm not going to get into here, uh, to all sorts of people in Stuttgart. Stuttgart buys a piece of property in the mil middle of the village, and the Jews of this little village called Buttenhausen plop a big monument, which the villagers don't like, in the middle of town. Um, and But actually, a funny thing happens is that the villagers come to realize that this monument has made them, has made this obscure little place, which has gotten a lot poorer since all the Jews were forced out, um, into a place that people talk about. And so people are coming in, bringing business, and so they start to get, they start to get the hang of it. And they're one of the first ones who, also for some problematic reasons, um, put up a monument for uh, the destroyed synagogue, and they do this in 1966, two years before the uh, 30th anniversary. So, and for German terms, that's quite early. So there are what economists call knockoff effects of this work, um, but it wasn't the case in Heigeloch, for example, but in part because when the Jews left Heigeloch, they left Heigeloch. So I'm working through the cases still. You uh, mentioned 1980 was a landmark year. Where, where am I looking? <laughs> ah, sorry. Uh, yes. You said 1980 was a landmark year that saw a big shift. Uh, what was happening in 1980 to cause that? Oh, good question. So a whole bunch of things were happening, but they were ha happening right before 1980. So in 1978 was the 40th anniversary of Kristall, uh, the November po pogrom or Crystal Night. Um, and Germany is a weird place with anniversaries. It actually organizes a lot of public life around them. A lot of cities began to commemorate this event. Um, so that's one thing that's happening. Another thing that's happening is that um, there is a movie which I don't know if many, any, I'm sure that some of the 
not quite 20 year olds in the room maybe saw in 1978. And this is a TV show called Holocaust, starred Marilyn Streep. And this was a major blockbuster event in the United States. Um, this, this TV show was, was uh, modeled on another TV show series, um, which most of you have probably also not heard of, called Roots, about an African uh, family. And when this came to Germany, it caught fire. So it was a case of a television intervention also making people interested. But it was not just that. There were other things. Um, there, was, there was important legislation about whether or not um, murder during the Holocaust is fayet. Yeah, what's it called in English? The Statue of Limitations is up. Thank you. <laughs> the Statue of Limitations sh should be up. And ultimately, with the, there was a famous Christian Democrat, so more on the conservative side of the spectrum, who got up and said, the crimes we're looking at, can, the Statue of Limitations should never be let up. And that is, in fact, what happened. And so, but, it, but that debate, transfixed people. And then finally, there's something which, which a lot of you will think is funny, but it also, was also a major event in a way. The, the president, not the chancellor, but the more figurehead kind of president, put, uh, had been putting on these nationwide high school level essay contests. And at this time, they changed the topic to everyday life in National Socialism. So what happens in all these German high schools is that the teachers say to their students, OK, we, you, this year's or this semester's class assignment is to go to your hometown and write something about what happened. And so you have all these high school kids. They go and they write these essays. Some of them are quite good. We were talking about one earlier this morning that I happen to have read, and who is now a professor in our world, Michael Brenner. Um, and so suddenly you had a lot of young students asking questions. So these things are all coming together in a kind of like tsunami wave. And so when this begins, people start to engage in projects, and they do so. Actually, one of the really, so there are lots of levels at which they do so, and lots some levels which they don't do so, so much. Not so much from the party political level, but it comes a lot from schools. It comes an awful lot from um, uh, the Volkshochschule, which is like the adult education centers. And it comes a lot from pastors and priests. Um, and it comes a lot from just people joining clubs to say, hey, in our town, we should do something. And finally, it comes a lot from, this is the other funny context, uh, between 1978 and about 1983, um, the real prices in air, transatlantic airline travel went down by about a half. They didn't look like that because of you know, inflation and stuff like this, but they actually did. And so more people traveled back. More Jews traveled back, back to Germany, went to their hometown. They would walk around and say, why is the cemetery looking like such a mess? Um, why haven't you done anything about the synagogue? It's, it's a movie theater now. Why is that? Can't we at least put up a plaque or something like this? So there's a lot of interaction at this level. And the contexts are not the context you would think about necessarily, but they are, they together form something. And that is the real beginning of that boom. But you also have a question, a young lady over there. Um, I, as a fellow enjoyer and connoisseur of maps, I noticed that, right here, uh, I noticed that in, in your map of w the November, uh, what, what was it? How do I pronounce it? Yeah. The November program. 
there was a lot of violence concentrated in Western Germany, specifically in Pfalz and uh, south yeah. southwestern Hessen. I was I was wondering why uh, those specific areas had high rates of um, uh, violence against yeah. Jews. It's a good question, but it has a simple answer to it. Oops, sorry. Uh, it's a good question. It has a simple answer, and this is that's where the synagogues are. That these are areas of Jewish settlement. Almost every synagogue was desecrated or destroyed. Uh, and very definitely almost every working syn synagogue. So that's what you're, what you're really looking at is where are the synagogues. Hi. 